Podcast. I'm your host, Noel Martinez, and today we're absolutely honored to have two incredible guests with us here today. Liesl Ells, co-founder of the Ells for Autism Foundation and Dr. Marlene Sotelo, executive director. We're gonna talk a little bit about their remarkable journey of the foundation, its impact, and what's to come. Ladies, welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for having us. So let's start from the beginning. Tell me a little bit about, um, Liesl, tell me a little bit about how you and Ernie started Els for Autism. You know, we have two kids. Our daughter just turned 25 and our son turned 21 October last year. So when he was three years old, um, well, no, I shouldn't, I should say when he was born, we pretty much knew there was something not the same with him than his sister. Not that we were experts, you know, how that goes when they're babies, you're not sure what to expect. And boys are supposed to be different and slower than girls, people keep telling you. But it was pretty evident that there was something awry with our boy. And at three, he was officially diagnosed as being on the spectrum. And we were in England at that stage. And things over there were not at that point in time as far advanced when it came to research and facilities available to those on the spectrum. And we were also spending a lot of time in the U.S. for my husband's golf. He is a professional golfer. So um, we, as a family, made the decision to move to the U.S. for our son's sake. And we joined a small little charter school of 45th Street. And um, at that time, they were fundraising for a bigger facility, a 10-acre facility. And, you know, we obviously now had vested interests in there. And we knew that the cramped spaces and the long wait list, really, they needed help. And we were in a position where, because of his profession, um, my husband's name helps us in fundraising. And we knew we could escalate their efforts forward. And, um, you know, our dreams for what we thought could be built was a little bit bigger than a 10-acre facility. So we sort of um, embraced their efforts and put a bigger spin on it just because we wanted to dream those that saying dream bigger and your dream should always scare you. Well, I think I have very scary dreams yes. for yes. Marlene's <laughs> <laughs> liking, but in any case, so the need was big and we pretty much knew that if we really put all our efforts in this, we could make it something really special. There were such hardworking people already working in this organization, trying to get something off the ground. And um, the Else for Autism Foundation was born out of the, their dreams. And we then just built that out into what we have today. And it's a 26 acre facility up in Jupiter. And, um, you know, now we're just putting all our efforts into building out that facility and in the process creating programming that we can disseminate across the world. So it's been a wild journey from 2009 till today. And the first buildings opened in 2015. Yeah. So it's been a long, tedious road. But, you know, next year will be 10 years since we first moved onto the facility. The first kids in been wild. It's an amazing facility. I've, I've had the opportunity to tour it and, and have been there many, many times. It's absolutely gorgeous. And what you guys have done is, uh, is amazing. Marlene, let's talk a little bit about you. So how long have you been with the foundation? 10 years this 10 year. 10 years. So you came to help <laughs> start it, right? Yes. Yes. There was nothing there, just grass. And when I interviewed, Liesl brought me, well, the second time, first I said no. And then she brought she me. She did say no the first time? Of course she did. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> she's a scaredy cat. Ah. She even scared her. You'd be scared, too, if you knew her well. <laughs> she dreams really big and will not take no for an answer. So, But uh, the second time, she brought me over to the campus, and it was just the, the, the idea of having a blank canvas to paint uh, a world of differences for people with autism was very compelling for me. And to be able to bring all the knowledge that I had in working with people with autism for so many years to this blank slate was very exciting. So tell me a little bit about the programs at, at Ells for Autism. Tell me a little bit about you know what they look like. What, what kind of programs do you have there? 
So I'm going to give you to Marlene there because she's the expert. Marlene's a, her, okay, Marlene's a pro. Her explanation of it will just be far better than mine. Well, she knows very much as well, so she just <laughs> wants to make me do all the work. Uh, and the, the, the programs that we have start with little kids. We have diagnostic clinic. We've actually diagnosed a child as young as 12 months old. And we just started using some AI technology called the Early Point technology, which uses um, eye tracking to be able to determine whether an individual is at risk for autism. So we just started that this year. And then we go through early intervention services, speech, behavior, and occupational therapy through the school age, as well as then for adults, which you were there, you volunteered in our sea of possibilities with your team. And so we have the adults who create these beautiful pieces of art for the Sea of Possibilities, and they're out at the Palm Beach Gardens Market, at Manatee Bay Lagoon, and, and at 10 different gift shops, um, nine in particular in Florida. How is this foundation different from other organizations like this? Well, first of all, you have Ernie and Liesel. That as, helps. At, at, the, at the head, right? And um, they are such... It's such a beautiful family with so much love and so much determination to make a difference in the whole world of people with autism. This is not just about Florida. This is not about the United States. This is about the whole world of autism. And that's what's so exciting to be part of. And regarding the programs, what's different is that we have everything that you could need as a family for your child with autism. And we'll even have more when we have our medical building. So the only thing that we don't or will not offer is housing. But other than that, we do everything from diagnostics to early intervention. We have a public charter school on our campus. And then we serve individuals all the way till they pass away or don't need us anymore. Tell me don't about you your... love how with confidence she said we won't have housing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> see, is that something is that something that's because... coming later or what? <laughs> There are no na no <laughs> absolute no's for no, Lisa. There, there's no boundaries. I just don't <laughs> like that things have an end. I think you should always be open to not just change and evolving, but to possibilities. You know, I well, not on the campus though. We'll have to buy <laughs> some more land. <laughs> you see, <laughs> you never know. You never know. Well, let's. It sounds like we're talking a little bit about excellence. So, talk to me a little <laughs> bit about the L Center of Excellence. What does that mean to you? You know, to me, it's. Every time somebody drives into the building, and this is more for from everyone's perspective, from a parent's perspective or from the client's perspective, I want them to drive through the gates and know that inside of these gates, we're going to try our absolute best. We won't always succeed. We will make mistakes, but we're going to try our absolute best to be the best. Excellence should be a continuous striving to be the best. And if, if you drive in and you read that every day that you come to work or that you come to attend a therapy, I want you to feel good about yourself, that you're getting it within these walls. And I want you to believe and for everybody in there to strive to be the best. It's, it's not always attainable. We make, we definitely make mistakes. We all make mistakes, but you can only try and learn from that and be better and continue to strive to be the best. And I think that and while you're doing that, collaborating with others becomes so important and the only way to stay at that top and be excellent. Marlene, can you give us some examples of how the center has impacted people's lives, families' lives? Do you there? have a whole week? I, I'm because sure. It's, it really is endless. Um, I'll give you an example. There was a family, because we have families that come from all over the world to Palm Beach County to, to seek services from Els for Autism. Well, how do they find you guys? So tell me about that. So well, it's word of mouth, also through marketing efforts. And we have a network of, of professionals that we collaborate with. One in particular is a neurologist from Brazil. And uh, my colleague and I have traveled there for conferences and consultation. And so we had a family that came to the center and they spent a couple of weeks and we evaluated the child and we also assessed what were the programmatic needs that the child had. And we developed a program and we trained the parents as well as the therapists that came on how to help the child so that when they go home, they could continue the program. Well, it turns out that the child was doing these behaviors that everyone thought that he was just being difficult or that he was trying to escape doing any work. And we noticed, uh, no, I don't think that he can see right. He's not looking at the paper really up close because he wants to avoid doing his homework. It's because he can't see. 
Now, the, the parent was a physician, and so there was pushback, right? No, well, no, I'm a physician. I would, have, I would have caught that. And we said, it's okay. We're seeing it from a different angle here. Let's rule out that it could be that. Well, it turns out that it was. The child wasn't seen properly, and so that's why he was always doing this behavior. It's been life-changing for this family. They, they had lost hope in that they couldn't break through to have him learn because they thought that he was engaging in these behaviors when really he needed a pair of glasses. And so our team is very acute at looking at these subtle changes in the child and being able to be a detective. And they're multidisciplinary. So, exactly. You know, you as a parent look at your child out of a certain pair of glasses. As a mom, yeah, Sorry. as a mom and yeah, dad. As yeah. a mom and dad, yeah. as we're caring. They look at it out of therapy eyes, and it's different. It's a speech therapist, it's a neurologist, it's, you know, an occupational therapist. So when they, as a team, look at a behavior or a certain situation, that's when things like that get picked up, which we as parents miss. Mm -hmm. You know, when we look at our kids, even if we're physicians, we look at them as parents. Of course, not, yeah. Not necessarily as that physician. So... so to walk me through a typical day for a student. Like, so they, is it like a like school? Like well, they... it depends on, it depends because some children will, will come just for recreational activities. We have a, a small um, practice golf course on our campus. Of course, of course you do. Yeah. Of course we do. <laughs> and so we have golf, yoga, tennis. We have music therapy, dance, dance therapy, dance. And so we have all these after school recreational activities. So somebody might just come from the community to access those programs. But let's talk about people who stay all day. So we have little kids that are two and three years old that are there for 20 to 25 hours. They arrive, they're super cute. They and they they come to the front, their parents drop them off with a little backpack and they go with their therapist to our early intervention classroom. And they're engaging in play activities so they don't really see it as therapy, but boy, there's a lot of learning going on there. They're playing with the dolls, they're going on the playground. Just It looks like a typical classroom, but every child has a one-to-one -one instructor. And they go and have lunch, and then they go home. Some of them will stay, and they'll have speech therapy and occupational therapy. Then on the other side, we have the adults. We have one of our adults that's in the program. He's 52 now because we celebrate it. I remember his 50th birthday. And so that program is every day from 9 to 3, and they go out in the community. They volunteer at Big Dog Ranch, at the Peggy Sue um, Animal Rescue. They also do um, they grocery do shopping. Beach. They, yes, they do beach cleanup as well. And so they do social activities. They also do uh, recreational activities on campus. And they just continue learning and growing and connecting even after high school. So you guys have like a mock uh, apartment. Like you, We do. So can you talk a little bit about that? You have a mock, mock apartment. You have like... A store. I remember. I remember going in there, yes. and you teach some of your students, you know, what it's like to have a job. Exactly. So, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, we we do vocational training, and so part of it, yes, is a two bedroom suite that actually was furnished by the Breakers, so they donated all the furniture in there, and there they get to learn how to work in a hotel room, how to set up and break down a hotel, a hotel room. room, but they're also learning how to take care of their own apartment. So how do I make a bed for myself? How do I do the dishes and the laundry? So we have that. And then we also have a golf pro shop, of course. And so there they learn how to fold the clothes, how to sort, how to be able to um, check somebody out at the cash register. So they're learning about working in the retail industry. And then we also have the Stanley Black & Decker woodworking shop. That's right. And yep. so they can work as a handyman or work in a home, home Depot or be able to take care of their own home as well. So we do a combination of vocational training, but they're also learning independent skills at the same time. And the cafe. Oh, in the cafe, of course. Are you ready to bring your ribbon cutting to the next level? Introducing the Ribbon Cutting Ceremony Recap Video, your key to unforgettable event marketing. We know that each business is unique and that's why we offer tailored solutions, starting with our basic package, where you can commemorate your event with elegance, even without the video. But why stop there? Our comprehensive event coverage and premier business launch packages include the game-changing recap video, capturing every vibrant moment of your grand opening, from the ribbon cutting to impactful speeches, all in a stunning one-minute video. Best of all, your event's highlights won't just linger in the memories of those who attended. Through our partnership with the Palm Beach North Chamber of Commerce, your video will be featured across multiple platforms. Expect to see your business shine on social media, 
in newsletters and our website and even the acclaimed Palm Beach North podcast. Don't let your special day fade away. Make it a monumental one with the ribbon cutting ceremony recap video and reach audiences beyond your wildest dreams. Ready to elevate your grand opening? For pricing and more details, email katie at pbnchamber.com or visit our website for more information. Make your event unforgettable. Let's talk about the cafe. The cafe, the Big Easy Cafe, that's another living vocational lab. So, of course, it's great food. Uh, we all enjoy eating there, and all visitors that come to the campus can eat there. But we also use that to train adults with autism how to work in the food industry. So right now we have these two guys that are loving it. They come three days a week for half day and they learn all aspects of the food industry and how to get a job at, at a restaurant. Tell me a little bit about the funding for the organization. So obviously you've got to fundraise a ton, right? A ton, a ton, a ton. <laughs> a so a ton <laughs> to be able to do it, to be able to offer the resources that, that you have. So yes. tell me about that. Where does all your funding come from? Well, it comes from various sources, but I, but I have to say that if it wasn't for the family and for their name and for Ernie out there talking about, about what we do, uh, it would be really challenging. But the story of the family is so compelling, and the amount of work that we've been able to accomplish to share with the world has really helped propel our uh, the success of our fundraising. So our biggest fundraising is really done through our Golf Challenge series that we do throughout the country. And so there are tournaments that are held in different cities across the country. And in each of those cities, we uh, do an, a clinic for people with autism in, in that, that city. Oh, wow. So we've developed our oh, wow. own specialized curriculum to teach people with autism how to play golf. So we do a one-hour clinic. We partner with an autism um, organization as well as a golf organization that will put on this special clinic while the golf tournament is going on. So it's good education for the golfers, and it's an opportunity for the local community to get back something from us being there fundraising in their backyard. We also do a lot of promotion about autism awareness, and the golfers also get the opportunity to have free consultations with myself or one of the other specialists. Um, so that's our biggest fundraising. And then, of course, major donors. So we have uh, local donors as well as um, nationwide donors that give. And then we're always applying for grants, of course. lots of grant writing, lots of grant reports um, that we have to do. And then we also recently received a state appropriation from the state of Florida Agency for Persons with Disability for our new project, because we don't stop <laughs> with one building. We're going to go on to the next. And we have our recreation complex that we just received state funding um, for $1 million. Years. And yes, two years. Uh, so we have $2 million from the state to launch our capital campaign. Tell me about, so what else is coming? I mean, you guys have done some amazing, <laughs> amazing things. So what, what's next? Well, the she, she sort of alluded to it. There's definitely this rec complex in the back of the campus mm -hmm. is first right up front for us at the moment. And in there will be a, a um, indoor a cafeteria because I have a thing about kids eating in a classroom. I feel they should be eating in a cafeteria like all other kids would. Mm -hmm. And to teach you that a classroom is where you get taught and a cafeteria is where you go to have your meals. Socialize, those social skills are so important for our students. And then um, a gymnasium, something where they can do their exercises under air conditioning. Yes, we need that down here in Florida. <laughs> Currently, we're running in a courtyard between our two um, um, school buildings, which is hilarious. Um, but sometimes it is just too hot and we really need that air conditioned space. And, um, you know, of course, uh, my favorite part of it oh, is the swimming, <laughs> and the, splash the swimming pool with a splash pad, <laughs> because I think, you know, I don't know if you know, but um, drowning is the number one cause of death in the autism community. I read that in preparing yeah. for this interview. I read that. Yes. Yeah. So for us, it's very important, and very close to the heart. Um, to, to get that off the ground. But for me personally, I think a splash pad is this one thing that involves all kids. It involves, you know, those kids with special needs and those without where they can come together and a level playing field and everybody wants to be part of a splash pad. And it's also a way to introduce the water in a non-threatening way. And then from there, gradually teach them how to do the swimming. Um, you know, we were just um, reading up on the latest statistics that in the last two and a half years, I think we said over 70 kids yes. on the spectrum drowned in, in Florida. Florida alone. 
So, I mean, that's a shocking number. It is. It's really very sad. Yeah. A few of those were people that were part of our community. Uh, not that everyone isn't part of the community, but you know what I mean, um, very close to us. So it's very personal. And um, I think it's a very needed thing to be done. And we'll just absolutely complete that rec complex. So you have, both of you have accomplished so much in the last 10 years, right? With this organization. Talk, talk to me a little bit about some of the challenges along the way. What, what have been some of the bumps in the road over the last 10 years? She's a bump. She no, is. No, just, <laughs> <laughs> she's a bump. Besides each other. <laughs> <laughs> we don't love hate relationships, yes. right? The two blondes. We, we absolutely do. Whenever there's something that we can't figure out, it's an off campus phone conversation where both get to say, as loudly what they both think of a situation and yes. normally I'm right. No, I'm just <laughs> All right, easy. No. Do I need to separate yeah, no, you guys? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> no, um, in all honesty, I mean, we, we have a 26 acre facility and we have a responsibility to build out that facility and to make sure that the funds that we raise um, are never um, misused or not used at mm. all. And for me, over the years, I've visited so many places where they they go, they gung-ho, great fundraising, get their first project off the line, and then project number two, three, and four kind of fall by the wayside. They never get there. And that, to me, was the biggest mountain I saw when I went around to other pro people and projects. And the thing that feared I feared the most, that once your first building goes up, the funding will stop. And I think we've managed to keep the momentum going. And I and that is one of the most important parts and one of the biggest secrets to tell anybody that is fundraising for a really big project. Yes, break it, break it down into smaller projects, but make sure you keep your momentum going. Start fundraising for the next one while you're still fundraising for the previous one. Mm -hmm. You know, just so you can keep the ball rolling and keep moving forward. Money is always a stumbling block. Of course, yeah. Um, and, and with that, not only is the fundraising, but because I just completed your survey that you wanted from people who live in Palm Beach County, yeah. what are the needs? Mm -hmm. And one of the things I added on there is the need for ex experts in autism to, li to live here. Um, but we have people that are entry-level teachers that can't afford housing here, right? And so we want to have the best people working with these wonderful humans that we serve. And so it becomes challenging for us to recruit and retain staff mm -hmm. that are highly qualified. And I, for me, that's one of the biggest challenges because there's always going to be such a generosity. Somehow, some way, we're going to find the money because people know that we're, we spend their money in the right way. But if I don't have the staff that I can trust to treat that child like their own, then it becomes challenging to actually make our mission uh, a reality. What else can we do to recruit the right people to move here? I mean, so we know housing housing costs is an issue. There's no doubt, mm -hmm. right? I think we, we talked about it. We survey our, our chamber members two, three times a year. And I'm going to tell you for the past three years, the number one issue has been housing that's affordable. So I get that. Mm -hmm. What else can we do to, to, to recruit the right people? Uh, I, I think also um, reimbursement rates, which we're working with the state to be able to discuss that and help to make changes. So if you're private pay, there are, there are a lot of insurance costs in your co-pays. So we're working with insurance companies on that. And then if you're receiving state funding, then the reimbursement rates that we get for staff, uh, their hourly rate is is not sufficient. They'll, they'll make more if they go work at Starbucks, let's say. And they, they won't have to worry about the challenges, the heavy heart challenges that are part of working with people with autism and, and other disabilities. And so uh, if we can work with insurance companies to provide greater coverage and, and with the state to increase their reimbursement rates for the workers, that would also help. So we talked a little bit about some of the challenges. What are you guys most proud of? And I want to ask you both separately, right? I don't want you together to answer this. You can't speak as one now. <laughs> you can't speak as one, right? No, because you guys I have think... been together for 10 years. So yes. I'll do it out of a parent's perspective. What, yes, let me what hear What I, as a parent, am the most proud of, and I 
often say this, so um, for those that have heard it, sorry. But when I drive up in the morning to drop my own child off, this is super, super personal to myself and Ernie because it's our child as well. So when we make a decision, it impacts not just the facility or the foundation, it impacts us as a family. So for me to drive in there in the mornings and drop off my child and just for a couple of minutes, drive around the corner and look back at other parents dropping off and oof, and seeing the joy and sometimes the challenges, but just seeing people interact with one another. You know, we spoke the other day about the first day of school. Once kids have had three months off for summer holiday and they then have to come back to school, it's always challenging. I don't care who you are. So for our kids with special needs, that separation on that day one is scary. And, and some people don't cope with it. They don't remember the fun they had. They just see it as a fear of the unknown. So to see, and we had a conversation about something that, that our staff observed at, at the charter school that's on our facility as well. Um, seeing how the teachers and the therapists were huddling on the ground next to a kid that was having some difficulty entering the school and how they explained things with pictures to that kid. It made me so emotional because I know that as a parent, that's all I ever wanted. Care, dignity, treat my child with dignity in those difficult moments. Easy moments are easy. We can all cope with those. But it's those difficult moments and to know that staff will Take their time to make sure that your child is treated with dignity. To me, that was that's a highlight for me for why we're doing this and why we have to keep doing this for as long as we can. You guys are doing an amazing job. With Thank it. you. They really, really are. Arlene, how about you? <laughs> what are you most proud of? You're so, part of this, like you're part of the family. I, see that, yeah. I know <laughs> the way I'm treated as a part of the family. And no, I, I really do feel part of the family and very honored to be able to make the, the vision and the mission of this uh, family come true through the programs and services that I've led in developing and executing, as well as disseminating out to the rest of the world. And, and that's what I, I never really thought of what I might be most proud of, but I think that's really what it is, is. We were in our board meeting today and we were talking about how we we create programs here in the hub of Jupiter, Florida, that the world is looking at, that we are helping people that cannot live in Jupiter, Florida, that live in another state or live in another country. And we're testing, we're creating testing and allowing other people to replicate the beauty of what we've created here. And that's what I'm most proud of, that we've been able to, to do that, whether it's through research studies or through replication manuals for others to be able to do. Is there anything that we haven't talked about today that we need to talk about? Is there any information we want to get out there to, to the world? You want to talk about you can employ a little bit? Uh, yes, that, that's a great idea. That's a great idea because I think that's a great call to action for everyone who's viewing this podcast and to really elevate Palm Beach County in particular with our support to be an autism inclusive employer. So we started a program called You Can Employ. And what we do is help companies to become inclusive employers and be able to understand how to recruit, hire, onboard, and retain employees with autism. People with autism have very specific skill sets um, we all do, but they have some skill sets that are very good for certain businesses. They're also extremely loyal. And when you talk about retention, that's one of the issues of staffing. We hire people and then they leave. But the person with autism, you hire and they're there for, for a good, they're there for a long time for you. And they're there every day. And so we're working with companies now to work with their HR department to be able to help them to do exactly that. And from the entry-level job all the way to the CEO job, in fact, there's, there's a CEO with autism that's one of our sponsors, and he's uh, the CEO of a very large company. And so people for, with autism can do anything and everything given the right supports. And it starts with the interview process. Mm -hmm. And so many people get overlooked. They never get hired. You know, it's not like they get hired and fired. They never even get right. hired. So if they can just adapt that a little bit to see the potential and not the deficits of these people when they come for their interviews. And then once they're in the company, if, if we can help you 
make sure that your environment, both sides, both sides, the client from our side and the company who's hiring, we can support both sides to make sure that we don't set you up for failure and offer support through that adjustment period. And the reward at the end of the day for companies when they do this is you can't touch it. It's not something, it's not just monetary because of the retention rate and because of the um, work ethic of the people that you're hiring. But it is about that feel good factor that you can't put a price tag on. It just changes the whole dynamic inside and within the employees towards one another. And that feel good factor is so important, especially in these days where there's so many pressures from all sides on us. That when you can feel good when you go to work, that's a huge bias. Right. And it helps managers to be better managers for all. How, how do we get the information out on that program? Like so you, you can contact me. Um, you can also go to our website. The, the website for You Can Employ is letter U, C-A-N-E-M-P-L-O-Y, youcanemploy.com. And uh, so we're here and we're ready. We've had several companies in Palm Beach County that have employed our clients and um, Jupiter Medical, PGA uh, National, um, the, the coffee shop uh, Oceana. Yeah, Oceana. I, I could go on the the local uh, car wash, Blaze Pizza. Uh, but yes, Blaze Pizza, Bole. Uh, it's it's incredible the support that has been out uh, outpoured by the organizations in Palm Beach County, and we're looking forward to working with some more of the businesses. We are very privileged to live in Palm Beach County. I always say. We as a family are very privileged to be in America because you're such a giving country to begin with. But in Palm Beach County, to have our foundation here and to have our programs being able to be disseminated in the local community, the open arms with which we've been accepted by local businesses and the support that we've received from local businesses, it's how we test our programs and how we prove to other companies that it works. The results are here locally, but that we can take countrywide and absolutely worldwide. So it, we can't do it without the local support. So we're lucky. We're very lucky to be in this amazing. Well, I'll, I'll say something. We're very lucky to have you in our county. You guys are, <laughs> are you. the work that you're doing, the impact that you're making is truly inspiring. You guys are unbelievable. And thank you so much for spending some time with us on the Palm Beach North podcast. Anything else before yeah, we go, before and, we say bye to anybody, anything else? Anybody watching that wants to come and see what we do, wants to just come and tour the center, please feel free. You're always welcome. Just contact us at the center and we'll set up a tour for you. And great. the cafe does offer catering. That's yeah. right. Yes. Great catering. We've had some of their food, so really, really good. Yes. Well, thanks again. Thank um, continue you. to do continue to do all the great, amazing work that you guys are doing. Thank you so much for tuning in uh, to the Palm Beach North podcast. We look forward to seeing you in a couple weeks. See you soon.